Hi, Joe. Good morning, Bob. How are you doing? Just great. Beautiful day here in Washington, D.C. Good. Glad to hear it. Let me introduce us. I'm Robert Wright. This is The Wright Show, uh, of which I'm host. I'm also publisher of the Non-Zero Newsletter. You're Joseph Cirincioni, expert on nuclear weapons, uh, nuclear proliferation and non-proliferation, arms control, author of the book Bomb Scare, The History and Future of Nuclear Weapons, also book Nuclear Nightmares, Securing the World Before It Is Too Late. Uh, your fellow at the Quincy Institute, I think you teach at the Georgetown uh, School of Foreign Service. And uh, we're going to talk about nuclear weapons and nuclear war, especially as these things pertain to Russia. Um, I want to start out by talking about uh, what's on a lot of people's minds, which is, uh, is there a real risk of the current war uh, spinning out of control and leading to the use of nuclear weapons? Uh, you know, what kinds of things could we do to minimize that chance and so on? So I wanted to, I wanted to start with that. Like, what is the most likely scenario uh, by which uh, I assume that the, uh, we're all we're all thinking the U.S. would not be the one to introduce nuclear weapons. NATO would not be. Mm -hmm. Even though we don't actually have a no first use policy, it's very hard to imagine a scenario here where we would be the first ones to use them. But I gather there are grounds to worry at least a little that, that Russia might be. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. I, I think the chances of nuclear use are quite low and have declined in the last couple of weeks, but they're not zero. And that should worry all of us. The fact that their nuclear weapons are in the mix that we are, I would say, closer to the potential use of nuclear weapons now than we have been since any time since the 1980s mm. and probably in the 1960s. The two great scares, the Cuban Missile Crisis of the 60s, the buildup in tensions between the Soviet Union led by Leonid Brezhnev and the United States led by Ronald Reagan in the early 1980s that resulted in millions of people going out in demonstrations in those years. Uh, th th those risks were real. We, we dodged the nuclear bullets in both those cases, but they're back. They never went away. Uh, the U United States and Russia both have about 6,000 nuclear weapons, about 40,000 in their sort of um, uh, obtainable or active stockpiles. And both sides have made clear that they see nuclear weapons as integrated into conventional combat situations. Both sides have this doctrine. The U.S. has no reason to use nuclear weapons first. It's not directly engaged in the combat. Its forces aren't committed uh, to this, this war. Putin does have a reason. I mean, his, his theory and his, his Russian practice uh, indicates this, that if they feel they are losing a conventional war, they have multiple nuclear options that they could deploy to reverse those trends and try to win the war. And uh, I, I uh, the risk was high about three weeks ago, I would say, when we, we feared that Russia was trying to might do something dramatic to try to break the stalemate that had developed. Now that we're, he's in a period of retreat, I think that risk is lowered, but it's not gone. We have no idea what this second phase of the war is going to look like. So it's still something we should be concerned about. OK, before we, we talk about how um, retreat might reduce the chances of using them. Let's drill down a little on on the nature of the arsenal, because I think that's relevant to the likelihood of him using nuclear weapons. They have some very low yield nuclear weapons, right? There's, there's a distinction, first of all, I gather, between strategic and tactical nuclear weapons. Tactical nuclear weapons might be used in a, in a more local sense. They are lower yield. And I gather that that Russia has lower yield weapons, the nuclear weapons, than we have. Is that right? I know we've developed low-yield weapons fairly recently for, like, submarines and things, but but uh, it's my impression they, uh, like, do they have, they have uh, actual artillery, actual uh, nuclear artillery, or, or what? How, how do we compare on that front, and how does that affect the likelihood of use? Yeah, both the U.S. and Russian arsenals are actually quite similar. And they've gone through sort of a similar evolution. Back when nuclear weapons were new in the 50s and 60s, 
Uh, the United States uh, led in ar the arsenal. We had thousands more nuclear weapons than the Russians did. They were playing catch up. And we perfected the art of multiplying nuclear weapons across dozens of, of platforms. I think there's, I, I read recently, there's 161 different delivery vehicles we developed for nuclear weapons, all kinds of things. Nuclear artillery, like you just mentioned, we used to have that. Torpedoes, landmines. Um, we even had a short range nuclear bazooka that could fire a, a, a sub kiloton atomic a weapon about a quarter of a mile so the, a the mile. firing wait, wait. team was was in the radius of the of the blast uh, from that weapon which was insane even the army figured that out we discontinued it in the 1960s we called it Good. the davy crockett that's a My, sign of growing enlightenment Glad growing that enlightenment. so we we envision nuclear weapons for all kinds of missions and particularly for stopping the warsaw pact we thought we had conventional inferiority to the Warsaw Pact, and we for our, younger, the only way for our younger viewers and listeners, the Warsaw <laughs> Pact during the Cold War was the Soviet equivalent of NATO. It, it, it included the, the Eastern European countries that were under Soviet uh, domination. And, right, and, and all the countries that are now in NATO. Pact. Yeah. Right. All those countries, Poland, uh, Romania, Bulgaria, etc., Czechoslovakia, all in the Warsaw Pact, East Germany. And we developed all these anti-tank weapons, basically artillery, short-range rockets, landmines. Well, after the Warsaw Pact collapsed uh, after 1991, we got rid of all of those. H.W. Bush, George H.W. Bush, basically denuclearized the Army, denuclearized the Navy surface fleet. But we kept some around. And the, the, the yield, uh, as, as you mentioned, uh, varies. We had very large what we call tactical nuclear weapons, meaning we would employ them on the battlefield. The tactical means that you're not engaged in a global thermonuclear war. This is regional war fighting within a country, within a region, a local targets. So we're talking, you know, tens, hundreds, maybe a thousand or so kilometers. That's tactical. But the yield can change. It could be a small weapon. It could be a large weapon. Some of the tactical weapons we had had the same exact warhead as we had on our ICBMs and submarine launch missiles, and the Russians had the same. So let's bring it up to date. The Russians have a large supply of tactical nuclear weapons, about 2,000, we think, meaning these are things that are de designed to be delivered over short ranges and at a range of yields. So they're airdrop munitions, uh, mainly. They're on their cruise missiles. Several, several of the weapons you've seen used in Ukraine are nuclear capable, which is one of the reasons you're worried, like the Iskander missiles, which is the a hy precision the hypersonic. Guided, the hypersonic, the Kinjal, K-I-N-Z-H-A-L, uh, hypersonic weapon that they've now used twice in Ukraine can be fitted with a nuclear warhead. And of course, there are various cruise missiles that you're seeing with devastating effect on the cities of Ukraine could also be fitted with nuclear weapons. And then how big a nuclear weapon? Well, both the U.S. and Russia have about the same um, range or, of, of weapons because the science is the same. The way you get a low yield nuclear weapon is you basically take your hydrogen bomb and, and take out the hydrogen. Take out mm -hmm. the deuterium, the lithium, the stuff that make that fuses the atoms together and releases that energy. That is fused together by a smaller bomb, an atomic bomb, Hiroshima, Nagasaki size bomb that's in there as the trigger. So every big bomb has a little bomb inside of it. You take the the big fuel out and you're left with a, a Hiroshima size size bomb, 15 kilotons, 20 kilotons, uh, up to 150 kilotons in certain instances. And then you can, what they call so, dial so, uh, yield. Just to uh, nail this down, so is it the case that kind of the lowest yield weapons in our arsenal are about what we dropped on Hiroshima? About. So the Russian, the, the, the one we fear the Russians might use is about two thirds of an Hiroshima, a 10 kiloton, 10,000 tons. That's their lowest yield weapon? Uh, they, they might be able to go a little lower, but maybe down to one mm. kiloton. And that's the same with us. Yeah. We have ranges of 0.3, so 300 tons of explosive force to 10, 15 uh, up to uh, up to uh, up to 150, and so these ranges, 500, 5,000 tons of explosive force, 10,000 tons of explosive force. They're small by nuclear standards. It's still an enormously explosive right. weapon, much bigger than any conventional weapon so, so either you, side you possesses. Just, you couldn't use it like 
very surgically. I mean, when we think of highly surgical strikes, you know, we think about like taking out a, a tank at, at one end of the spectrum of surgical ness, right? I mean, this is a case where if you if you if you hit a city, we're talking about killing tens of thousands, a hundred thousand people, and and yes. and if you don't hit a city, um, even I assume that uh, it's kind of hard to uh, confine the the scope of it very much, right? I mean, we're talking about a lot of drift of radiation, presumably. In right. Way. There's two effects that nuclear weapons have that conventional weapons don't have. So if you drop, say, a 10,000 ton bomb um, uh, on a city, you're going to get a very destructive force. It's the equivalent of 20,000 one ton bombs, which is the standard conventional bomb in our arsenal. So that's a huge destructive force. But then you also have heat. The, the, mm -hmm. the nuclear explosion is hotter than the surface temperature of the sun. So that sets off mega fires. And then you have the radiation, which kills people immediately, but then lingers and drifts around. It can kill thousands uh, in the years after the explosion. It never goes away, really, basically. So what's the most likely scenario where Russia actually uh, uses uh, a nuclear weapon in this context, the context of, of the, the war that's going on now? How, how can you imagine this un unfolding? Uh, unfortunately, the, as Putin fears losing the war, the risks of him using the nuclear weapon increase. And that's because uh, Russia has a doctrine. It's not clear how official it is, but it's been written about quite a bit called escalate to de-escalate, meaning if they're losing a conventional war with the West, and that's the way they discuss it, they would use a nuclear weapon first to demonstrate the seriousness of the situation and to cause the West to back off. And they could do that in a variety of ways. One that they discuss is a demonstration shot. So shoot a nuclear cruise missile and detonate it over the Black Sea. The other is they could use it on a target, say a military airfield or a military base um, in, in Ukraine. But it also includes the possibility of firing a long range strategic weapon at a NATO or U.S. target. I, I think that's highly unlikely, but the mm -hmm. first two are more likely. And they would basically be signaling nuclear signaling is a popular mm -hmm. concept in the arcane nuclear strategy that the West should back off. And then you'd be betting that the West would, and that is a high stakes gamble. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like according, it, is it the case that according to their doctrine, they would only use it in the case of an existential risk in the sense that, in other words, it isn't just that they're gonna lose a war somewhere in the world, it's that they're, they're gonna lose a war and the losing of the war threatens the actual sovereignty of Russia. In other words, like troops yes. coming into Russia, more bombs falling on Russia. Is, is it in a certain sense only in, in that kind of self-defense or is, is it not that clearly specified in the doctrine? It, it is, that is exactly how they specify it, an existential risk uh, to the nation, to okay. the nation. But then, and this has been debated in, in recent weeks among, among experts, well, what's the nation? Are we talking about the territory of Russia or are we talking about Putin? You know, right. uh, you know, and so if he feels that he personally is threatened, his power, his life, will he feel that his best shot is to is to roll the nuclear dice? I, I think that's what worries us. That's so, the high risk right. right there. So, for example, if if suddenly the war was going so bad for him, and it's not going this badly yet, uh, that it looked like, A, maybe Russia was going to gain no territory from the war. Right now, they are occupying you know, a fair amount of land that they weren't occupying before. They seem to have gained territory. But if it were the case that uh, he started losing in a way that threatened those gains, or even rolled back uh, the 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 control that they had before the war started, in other words, the control of those easternmost uh, yes. the easternmost part of the Donbass. And if he judged that he could not politically survive an outcome as bad as either of those outcomes, that would be an existential risk to the regime, in a sense. Yes. Yeah. That, that's exactly right. Like a, a a gambler at the poker table, you're losing a hand and you bluff. And you just say, OK, I'm going to go all in. I'm going to bet the house, betting that the other guy is going to back down.
And th that's why I was a little surprised to hear you say that the risk has been res uh, reduced yes. as a result of the retreat, because I'm thinking, well, if the retreat goes too far, it, it could he could start thinking he faces an existential risk to the regime. Yes, he could. So this, that's what you have to watch now. And, you know, the, the experts differ on this. It isn't like there's a you know a council of nuclear experts where we all get together every Monday morning and decide what the analysis is. Maybe there should People be. People differ, but here's my analysis. He is losing in a controlled manner right now. And that he it's quite possible that he could still gain some some territory out of this war, even though he's retreating from from Kiev, retreating from Western Ukraine. He, they claim that they're moving the forces to consolidate and perhaps prepare a new offensive in the eastern part, the Donbass mm -hmm. region, et cetera. Right. So if he can do that, that is probably a politically acceptable outcome for him. One that you could see a negotiation yielding him some territory, right. yielding him Ukrainian neutrality, et cetera. And that's acceptable. So he personally wouldn't be at risk. So what you're worried about is that second phase of the war going very badly for him. And that is quite possible, given the dismal performance of the, the Russian army or even a, a collapse scenario where you see the Russian army just just at some point tip over and collapse right. the way the Russians collapsed in the front lines of World War One, and, and soldiers just start voting with their feet and refuse to fight. So he, he, th that's a kind of thing. Ironically, therefore, what you're hoping for is a, a soft landing for Putin, a face-saving way out of this conflict so that you're minimizing the risks of any e escalation and maximizing the potential for a diplomatic solution to the war. Now, it seems to me that maybe in the last few days, the chances of a soft landing have declined in the sense that, you know, with uh, the retreat of the Russians uh, in uh, around the kind of Kyiv area, and the discovery of evidence of atrocities, there are more and more vociferous calls in the West wow. for doubling down on the arming of the Ukrainians and settling for nothing less than complete victory over Putin. You're hearing that more and more, you know, that a regime that would wow. that would do this, you know, uh, cannot be allowed to hold a, a, a square inch of territory in Ukraine, even though they were actually holding a fair amount uh, before the before the war, of course, that was all in violation of international law. It's not. It's not. I'm not endorsing it. But but from their point of view, that was something they already controlled. Um, so I, I I worry that uh, whatever the consequences of the initial part of the retreat may have been, what's happening right now in the last couple of days yeah. um, may be turning this into what could be a first of all a longer war, a bloodier war. Uh, and, and 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 push the possibility of peace uh, further down the road, yeah. and increase the chances of nuclear war. I, I, I think that is a real risk. And in, you know, in this business, it's hard to predict what's going to happen. I mean, who predicted this scenario seven weeks ago, right? Mm -hmm. So it's hard to predict. But what you can do is identify the factors and look at the trends, and that's what we're trying to do. Uh, here. So one trend that would indicate that you could get a negotiated settlement is how both sides have decreased their pre-war demands. So you no longer hear Putin talking about denazification, right? We meaning regime change in Kyiv. He obviously can't do that. That war aim has has failed. He no longer talks publicly or the Mer Russian press doesn't about demilitarization, meaning you know, disarming Ukraine. And the, on the other side, Zelensky's dropped his demand to join NATO, join the European mm -hmm. Union, talks about neutrality. He means an armed neutrality, Finnish style neut neutrality. And he's, he's he doesn't use the word one inch of, of uh, Ukrainian territory. Right. He wants to, to have a retreat back to what he says is the pre-February 24th lines. And that would include Russia remaining in some part of the Donbass region, Russia remaining in Crimea. So you see them getting closer, uh, potentially. But the other trend that you raise is very powerful and, and could change the whole calculus. I mean, the, the, the atrocities in, uh, in, in Butcha, I mean, 300 dead at least on the streets. The stories that are coming out even in today's paper of how people were retreated. I mean, that is going to rise passions. Zelensky, as we speak, 
is addressing the United Nations General Assembly and bringing this message to the war to the world. Ukraine has basically won the information war here and their message dominates, at least in, in most of the world, certainly in the Western world. So you could see Ukrainians, Europeans feeling Putin remaining in power is intolerable. He can't do this, or at the very least, he has to be brought before the International Criminal Court for trial as a war criminal. That could greatly complicate Which, possibilities of a negotiated settlement. Right. And, and then to switch back to Putin's perspective, I'd say two things. Um, first of all, uh, I don't I don't I, I doubt that he thinks that politically he can settle for those uh, whatever February 24th lines. I mean, the, the more losses they suffer, the more Russians die, the more equipment they lose and so on, the harder it is for him to come back and say, oh, by the way, we didn't gain any ground. I mean, he can, yeah. I, I don't think he I don't think he can do that politically or thinks he can do it. So so even if you look yeah. at what the two sides have said, it seems to be we're a long way from an actual settlement, given how much ground outside of the February 24th uh, lines the Russians already occupy and the fact that they are going to spend the next few weeks trying to expand whatever line there is in the Donbass um, westward and probably with some success. The other thing I'd say uh, mm -hmm. is, is it seems to me the, the war crime, the threat of a prosecution for war crimes makes uh, the possibility of his losing power in Russia seem like an even deeper existential risk to him. In other words, if he imagines a scenario where like he's deposed in a palace coup because he got nothing out of this war, and then down the road, the powers that be trade him, the Russian, the Russian government trades him, says, yeah, take him to The Hague if, 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 if this will uh, liberate us from all the sanctions or whatever. I mean, look, the guy... I don't know whether paranoid is the word, but he's a worrier, right? We know that he 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 sees forces arrayed against him, and so it seems to me that all of yeah. these things. I, look, I'm a worrier too. <laughs> this is maybe one thing I haven't got with him. So I'm I, 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 I'm I'm dredging up the darkest scenarios, but it seems to me like if the goal is to make this a short war and to reduce the risks of nuclear war, things are not moving in a good direction. Uh, those are all very valid points. I mean, clearly what Putin believes is going to happen next is he's going to shift the, um, the focus of the battles to the eastern section, and he's going to be able to push the Ukrainians back. But it's not, as you say, that's not at all clear. This entire war, we've been overestimating Russian military potential or and cyber potential for for that matter, including it there. We just haven't seen anything like what we thought we were going to see. So it is quite possible that the Ukrainians and remember the forces that are in the Donbass region are the most battle tested. They've been fighting the Russians for eight years now. This this war has been going on Ukrainian. for them since 2014. Yeah. So so this is not it's not at all clear that he can do much more than what he's doing now, which is uh, because he can't make offensive yeah. advances. He's attacking from the rear. He's doing the bombings, the cruise missiles, the artillery. Yeah. Most of that is happening from Russian held territory in Russia, in Crimea, in Belarus, right. attacking, attacking Ukrainian cities. That's his strategy right now. I haven't yeah. seen any any evidence that Russia is advancing, if not, if anything, they are in a harried retreat. They are retreating and they're being attacked well, they're by Ukrainian forces. But I mean, for example, they've pretty much taken Mariupol. It's it's a, it's it's from their point of view a mopping up operation. Yes. This that's a big city. I'm telling yes. you, and and you know that is in Donetsk province. That's yes, in that's one right. of the two provinces that he thinks should. Uh, well, he has said they should be independent. It may be that he wants to annex them. Who knows? But he wants yes. the whole things either way. They're not letting go of Mariupol. So if if that, for example, is a non-starter for the Ukrainians, there's exactly. no deal. And, I, and uh, you know, of course, the um, now, I, I guess on the positive side, you could say that uh, as far as and, and look, all of nothing is positive here. It's not positive. That he that that he has uh, used missiles to take out military 
facilities or that in uh, Mariupol. He's killed a lot of members of the Azov Brigade and will capture some probably. But among the implications of those things are that he can, he can make some claims. You're right, he's not repeating the, the Nazi, denazification, yeah. demilitarization stuff, but he can already make some claims on that front. He can say, yes. look, the real Nazis were the Azov Brigade. That, that is the part of the military with a neo-Nazi history. Um, we, we've taken a lot of them out. We captured some. As far as demilitarization, we've destroyed their infrastructure for building weapons, and, and they have done a lot of that. Uh, we've taken it and so on. So I guess that's good. It, again, there's nothing that's just good here. The destruction and, and suffering it, it is bad. It's it, it's it's like everything. Uh, it, it's extremely yeah. perverse. The way every every uh, uh, yeah. every good thing has a bad side, and and uh, some sometimes vice versa. But yeah, you take. My- I, I think that's right. And of course, he doesn't need facts to base his claims on. He can just make things up, as we see him doing every day. Yeah. yeah. So you know, um, when, I, when, I, when I'm interested in talking to you about, I really want to hear what you think of the sort of longer term implications of this war, given the scenarios we just sketched out and its its impact on, on domestic spending and our, our military budget on what you think about our, what it means for our, our overall standing in the world, because you think about these things. Uh, more globally than I do. Well, I'm flattered that you think <laughs> that you think. Uh, that you think we should turn the tables. I, I, I love I love the idea of being interviewed. Uh, the the um, uh, oh gosh, um, I uh, it I just find the whole thing completely depressing because and this is actually a way to put the ball back in, in your court a little because uh, the way I look at this, um, we have mismanaged our relationship with Russia egregiously. I am among the people who think that, although no, it, it certainly, this wasn't, quote, just about NATO when finally he decided to invade. At the same time, if you go back and try to reconstruct what put him in the mindset to invade, I, I think you have to start back with the decision to expand NATO and so on. Mm-hmm. So, so that's just my view. We, we don't need to litigate that. But, I, but, but if you're asking me, but it does lead to a question for you, which is, if you look at the souring of relations, and, and it, it it has been that in in the early part of the millennium, there are these signs that you know Putin would like Russia to be kind of integrated in in into Europe, and 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 there's a lot of you know, and 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 it's it's things aren't looking nearly so dark back then. There was a, a a a souring of relations that went on and on and on, and I think some of that comes in the realm of arms control. For example, yes. George W. Bush got out of the anti ballistic missile treaty. Putin didn't want him to. Bush knew Putin didn't want him to. Um, do you want to uh, talk about that yeah. a little? Explain what is the ABM treaty. Why did America think it made sense when they entered into it, which I think goes back to Nixon, maybe? Um, and uh, and what happened there? Well, this is a great example of one of these little tiny niche ish- issues that small groups of people worry about. And they warn that there's going to be global implications of this, but not nobody pays attention and the event passes. And then decades later, <laughs> the global implications are revealed. And that's exactly what happened with this ABM treaty. You may remember that this was a fetish for the Bush, George Bush administration. And when they were elected in, in, in early in 2001, they had six cabinet level meetings to Moscow in that year, trying to convince Putin to, to jointly abrogate the anti-ballistic missile treaty because they believed in this vision of America that t- could defend itself from nuclear weapons by its technological prowess, that we could develop systems that could shoot down any incoming ballistic missile. A total and complete fantasy, by the way. There's a new study out by the American Physical Society a few months ago that shows that all of our anti-missile programs attempting to shoot and intercept long-range ballistic missiles are a failure. They do not work, and there's no prospect for them working. But 22 years ago, this is what the Bush administration believed would happen. So they wanted out of this treaty. John Bolton leads the charge. We get out of the treaty, and like you say, Putin is saying, don't do this. If you do this, my response is going to have to be to build up my offensive weapons. 
Because any defense you create, the easiest answer is to overwhelm it with more weapons than you can shoot down, to, to jam it, to develop weapons that can circumvent it. And he said, I'm going to have to do this. Well, about 15, 16 years later, we, he reveals them in Moscow. Remember that conference? He revealed six new super weapons. These mm -hmm. were all weapons designed to circumvent uh, U.S. ballistic missile defenses. And you may have remembered there were uh, uh, hypervelocity weapons. There was this new super ICBM. There was this weird underwater torpedo drone thing powered by a nuclear reactor, a long range cruise missile that could go into continental distances, allegedly. All these crazy things all meant to intervene to in, to uh, overcome American ballistic missile defenses, which, by the way, if, if they work, they, they would do that. And in response, the U.S. then says, well, see, the Russian threat. There mm -hmm. we are. Now we have to build up our offenses. And by the way, the Chinese are doing the same thing because of our missile defenses and the abrogation of the ABM treaty, et cetera. The Chinese are think that, hey, maybe our missiles are vulnerable. We better build more of them so the U.S. can't take them out in a first strike and build them so they can de defeat any potential American defense. And even though we know they don't work, the Chinese and the Russians can't account on them never working. So they've got to design their forces to overcome them. And so now you have a Chinese missiles, more missiles being built for this very purpose. And again, we cite that as a growing Chinese threat, as if we've been doing nothing, and therefore now we have to respond, and there you are. Now okay. you're in a renewed nuclear arms race, just as we predicted would happen, and just what theory predicts would happen if you drop and go uh, the, the restrictions on defensive weapons and go all out to deploy them. The opposition has to deploy more off offensive systems. Here we go. That is a big factor in the deterioration of the relations between the, the, the West and the U.S. and China, and, a, and really is the, was the pivot point that, that triggered this new nuclear arms race we're, we're currently in. Right. And just to drill down a little on the original logic behind the anti-ballistic missile treaty, which is what in, in the goes back to the 70s. Does it go back to the Nixon administration? 1972, Richard Nixon, Henry Kissinger, they negotiate a strategic arms limitation talk, which would for the first time, this is the set early 70s, limit the U.S. and Russian arsenals, not make mm -hmm. anybody cut them, but just mm -hmm. establish a limit. But they recognize that in order to do that, you also had to limit defensive systems. Because if you had unlimited defensive systems, you're driving the, 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 the demand for offensive weapons. So you got to limit both, and that's what they did. And that stood for 40 years until the conservatives, who never liked it, who never liked the idea of arms control limiting American military. They believe that, that our superpower status requires us to have maximum military options, maximum flexibility. We cannot be limited by any international treaties. So for all this talk about the rules-based international order, they never like rules on weapons. And that's tr that view came back in the George W. Bush administration, and it's prevailed to this day. I mean, the ABM treaty was just the first of the nuclear guardrails that we took off. Trump took, took down the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty, a Reagan era treaty, the Open Skies Treaty that allowed surveillance of Russian military maneuvers. We sure would have liked that uh, to be in operation now. That was an Eisenhower uh, idea. And one by one, they just, they just dropped. The only remaining uh, treaty is the New START Treaty, and that expires in four years, and then the guardrails will be completely gone. And, and right now, it's looking like our relations with Russia probably in four years. Well, who knows? But uh, I see no, certain, no yeah. possibility of any kind of new arms control treaty with either Russia or, or China in the near future. We have, we have torched it. We have torched the regime, and we have very little credibility for building these up, and those two countries are not in a mood to... Um, to, to be talking with us. Don't see a strategic advantage in yeah. negotiating with us. You know, and the irony of, 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 as you said, conservatives basically being the ones who, uh, who, who led to the, the, uh, us getting out of the ABM treaty is, you know, Nixon and Kissinger weren't exactly, you know, weak need liberals. I mean, exactly. it, it was a very hard nosed kind of thinking that led them to the, uh, to want to ban Missile defense. It sounds ironic that you could think that your country will be more secure 
if you are not allowed to build defenses against nuclear weapons. But the truth is, it, through the logic of nuclear deterrence, which, however perverse, seems to have some effect, uh, it, it actually destabilizes things for one side to start worrying that the other side does have the capacity to intercept a lot of missiles. It, 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 and uh, so the, the, these guys were Absolutely. not, you know, and, and, and uh, so anyway, here we That's are. That's exactly right. Missile defenses are destabilizing. That is a key point that most people miss. Yeah. Um, the Because uh, the last thing you want is a fearful enemy. I mean, I mean, one downside is the one you mentioned. It, it, missile defenses are conducive to arms races. China is building more and more nuclear weapons because we put out, we put up these defenses that probably can't intercept a whole lot of the missiles anyway, but you Correct. know, the way countries are, they, they don't want to err on the side of insecurity. So, That's exactly so you right. get this arms race. Oh, it's, it's. Uh, and the same with the North Koreans. I mean, that new ICBM they tested, a b big, big, heavy ICBM, whichever one you think it is, the Wasong 15, the Wasong 17, there's some disagreement about what they tested. It's a big missile designed to carry multiple warheads and decoys and jammers to mm -hmm. get through any American defensive system. So the 44 interceptors we've deployed in Alaska and California, they can't intercept that. They would have mm -hmm. troubles intercepting a simple single warhead ICBM coming in. They only hit it half of the time in tests. You start putting jammers and decoys and multiple warheads coming out of that thing, forget it. There was no chance that we could defeat even a simple North Korean ICBM. And so that's, but that, and that, but that, the possibility that we could drives North Korea to develop these weapons because they believe, and the Ukraine war is, is sort of uh, indicating this, if you don't want to be invaded by a superpower, you better have nuclear weapons, mm -hmm. right? So North Korea yeah, doesn't want to yeah. be invaded by the United States, and they think we have to have nuclear weapons that can hit the United States. Yeah. And that will be our safeguard. That will be our deterrent force. It's hard to argue with that. Well, Muammar Gaddafi obliged us by getting rid of his nuclear program. That didn't work out well for him. You know, we, we keep we keep sending the wrong signals about what happens if you let go of your nuclear weapons program. That is exactly right. I mean, you look, nothing the United States did over the last 20 to 30 years justifies Putin's invasion. But a lot of things we did set the groundwork for it, including that war in Libya and you know, basically getting rid of a leader who had just made a deal with us to give up right. his uh, unconventional weapons, his chemical weapons programs, his ballistic missile programs, the, the centrifuges he had bought from AQ Khan that was, you know, still in the packing crates, shipped them all out. All of that stuff, he gave it up. And a few years later, we lit a military uh, operation that results in his death. That is a, that is a, the kind of negative lesson you don't want to be asserting to the world, although it was cheered on by um, neoliberals and, and conservatives in the United States. Yeah, and, and Putin felt betrayed in the sense that, uh, although he wasn't, he wasn't president at the time, he was prime minister, but Russia yeah. acquiesced at the Security Council in exactly. the Libya intervention on grounds that it was a limited humanitarian exercise, then it morphed into regime change, and, and he uh, apparently felt uh, very unhappy about that. You know, there's another issue that uh, apparently uh, is, has been very much on his mind, may have contributed to the invasion, has to do with uh, missile defense. We set up these, uh, I guess we, we either have or are about to, in Poland, we're establishing uh, some uh, def supposedly defensive uh, yes. missiles, and supposedly they're about Iran. I didn't realize Iran was on the verge of, of attacking Poland or whatever the scenario is, but um, but supposedly, what we're telling Putin is, don't worry, these are just to intercept missiles from Poland. Now, now I've heard two from things Iran. about, I, I'm, I'm sorry, from Iran. I've heard two things about his concern. One is that, look, obviously, they could be used to intercept missiles from us. And obviously, that capacity, though it sounds defensive, could be put to offensive use. It could make an attack on us uh, more likely to be effective if you can fend off any missiles we send over in retaliation, even conventional missiles, right? Um, and uh, But secondly, I gather, I, I don't know if this is true, but I've heard that the same missile launchers that we're, we're putting there that, that, that will, uh, that as part of the defensive system, 
could in principle be uh, altered to launch mm-hmm. offensive missiles like into Russia. Is that is that true? Yes, yes, absolutely. Yes, this is all true. So he's so not happy just... about this, and, and he sees it as a consequence of NATO expansion because it's Poland's membership in NATO that's a prerequisite for it. Right. I think I can do this in two minutes, maybe two and a half. So okay. first of all, this begins in the George W. Bush administration. This is part of the we're going to dominate the world through our military superiority. And one of the ways we're going to do that is using missile defenses to neutralize other people's weapons. So the idea is uh, Iran is, you know, ha- has missile programs. None of them are long range. None of them can reach Western Europe, let alone the United States, but they might be able to develop them and they might be able to develop a nuclear weapon. So we're going to put missile defensive systems into Eastern Europe, um, now countries in, in NATO. And they're looking at, uh, Czech, at the, the Czech Republic and Poland, Romania, Bulgaria, and they look, they settle on two of them. And we, and I was in the, the Obama administration gets elected and they want to ratchet back these plans because Iran does not have a weapon that could reach the United States and it, it doesn't have a nuclear weapon that they could put on the missile. I mean, there's no justification for the program, but here's the democratic weakness all the time. They're afraid of looking weak. Yep. So they don't want to back down from this. So I'm one of the people who got brought to the White House in um, in the early days of the Obama administration and uh, the vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs, James Cartwright, briefs us on the revision of the plan. And it is a better plan. It's more moderate, but it keeps these interceptor sites in, in Poland and in Romania. And here's the problem. These interceptor sites are basically a version of the Aegis system that's designed to shoot down medium range missiles from cruisers and destroyers. It's called Aegis Ashore. It's a land based version and it has interceptors in them that are fairly capable, but not against a long range threat like allegedly they're afraid that Iranians are going to develop. But what's worse is those tubes that we use because they're on destroyers and the Navy is very economical about its weapon systems. Those tubes can also fire offensive Tomahawk cruise missiles. And you don't know what's in those tubes. And this is the Putin complaint. He, it's not the, the interceptors that he thinks are going to be used to attack Russia. That same installation could have offensive weapons. And he says that's a violation of the INF Treaty, he says. The, and, we, and the U.S. doesn't want to give it up. And they keep coming up with inspection plans and things like that. But the obvious solution is not to have those systems in Poland or Romania because, one, there isn't a, a Iranian nuclear weapon. And two, they don't have a long range ballistic missile that could be fired over Europe and would threaten Europe with the United States. There's no need for it except politically. And that's the problem with the Democrats. They don't want to appear to be weak. And as a result, they actually undermine their strategic position. And, and what attack is it even most plausibly designed to fend off? I mean, in the near, in anything like the near term, is the scenario that Iran tries to attack Western Europe? And, and that's what, uh, which of course is, is kind of crazy in itself. If you, if you briefly review Iran's actual history, but um, right. is, that, is that it? It's like, it's not Both. even to protect because but, but, in a, in a, the Iranian flight path, if it was trying to hit the east coast of the United States, would yeah. take it over Western Europe, and that's where we. So, if they had would, a missile that could reach the U.S., which they don't, they, they and are nowhere near okay. being able to get, and it's not part of their program. They're not testing for okay. it. They're not trying to get such a system. They don't have one that could reach uh, Western Europe either. And yet, we have a defensive system that's designed to defeat. Uh, okay. And by the way. It can't do that. It even can't do that mission. So the threat doesn't justify it. The technology doesn't justify it. And you're left with symbolism, with politics. So to fend off this threat that doesn't exist, unless it's, unless you're talking about the some kind of electoral threat to Democratic candidates at home, to fend off a threat that does not exist, <laughs> we put in these missiles that actually do give Putin cause to worry. It isn't just that they would technically violate the INF, which I want to talk about because we abrogated that too, but uh, but um, but it does. It, these are missiles that that would give Russia less response time, I gather, than the missiles are that they already have to worry about. Is is that right? Oh, yeah, they wouldn't know they've been fired until they hit their cruise missiles. That's how close they wouldn't they be are. picked up by early morning. Uh, highly unlikely. Yeah, they 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 would 
their early warning would be when they exploded on Russian territory. So if you um, if you want to prevent nuclear war, one thing you try to do is keep either side from feeling so insecure that they have an, an itchy trigger finger, right? Exactly. You, you don't want the other side thinking, well, we're not going to have much response time. We think they just launched or we think they're about to launch. We got to act first. That's the last thing you want. And, and, it, and when you do that, which these missiles do, you've increased the chances of nuclear war. So to be able to posture about, about reducing some threat from Iran that does not even exist, we have increased the chances of, of nuclear war. And I think to some extent, increased the chances that he would invade Ukraine. This was yes. among his grievances. Yes, this is a contributing factor. No question about it. And again, this is, we're talking about still in the missile defense world. We haven't even touched NATO expansion, really, except that. You know, it, but I can't tell you how many meetings I was in with State Department officials, whether it was Undersecretary Ellen Tauscher, Undersecretary Rose Gottemiller, other State Department officials, where they would defend these sites. And, and they would argue this was not a problem. Why? Because they're not looking at it through the lens of... Um, alienating Putin, they think, look, he's he's a jerk. He's going to be he, he's making this up. He's going to be he's going to be unhappy no matter what. They're looking at it in terms of the Western alliance and and reassuring the allies and shoring up the alliance system, because that's basically what they're in charge of. They're in charge of making sure nothing gets weaker on their watch. And and they're afraid that if they pull those bases, uh, those systems out of Poland, out of Romania, that that will be a sign of a U.S. retreat the allies will lose confidence. That makes the overall situation weaker, et cetera. So that's how they look at it. And that's why they don't want to give an inch. Although by standard, the kind of standard deterrence reckoning I just described, it actually makes Western Europe more, more vulnerable to some kind of uh, to, to some kind of nu nuclear actual nuclear attack. I, I understand that I guess they're saying, but it's symbolism, is symbolism of American commitment. Well, okay, fine. Maybe there are other ways to do that that don't increase the chances of nuclear war. But um, the uh, now, as for the INF Treaty, uh, that stands for what? Intermediate Nuclear Forces? And Intermediate that's Nuclear Forces. Trump got, uh, got us out of? Or, yes, or so this is Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev negotiate this after the scares of the early 1980s, which were triggered by the U.S. and Russia pouring these intermediate nuclear range weapons into Europe. They basically was uh, 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 assembling the capability to wage nuclear war in Europe. Intermediate range means they're longer than short range, so longer than within a theater of battle, but can't span the oceans intercontinental, mm -hmm. but they can go the... 3,000 or so kilometers that a European war would involve. And we poured hundreds of weapons like this in there, hundreds. I mean, it's really insane when you think about it. And that's what set off the mass uh, demonstrations. And that's what the INF Treaty resolved. It got rid of, I, it's, it's about 2,000 total nuclear weapons, brand new weapons. They worked perfectly. We just scrapped them under that treaty. And it really was the beginning of uh, Reagan's effort to eliminate nuclear weapons. He was a nuclear abolitionist. He wanted to get rid of all of them. He couldn't make that in one fell swoop, did the INF Treaty first, and then the START Treaty, which cut U.S. and Russian arsenals in half. It was a Republican, a conservative Republican, working with uh, Mikhail Gorbachev that really broke the back of the arms race as we then knew it and started a long 30-year decline in global nuclear arsenals that has now come to a halt. Reductions that started then have now stopped. We're mm -hmm. flat and we're at this inflection point. And what happens in Ukraine, what happens with China can determine whether we go back up again or whether we can continue that decline. My prognosis is bleak. I think we're going back up again. We are in a new nuclear arms race. And the uh, I gather the INF, like, like pulling those uh, intermediate range missiles out of Europe was stabilizing for reasons we've we've kind of described. Oh, yes. in, other, in other words, Russia no longer, or at that point, the Soviet Union initially, no longer had such a short response time. They could kind of relax. Exactly. Like, like, we'll know for a while that the missiles are coming. We don't have to push the button in a panic. I mean, you're always in a slightly panic situation if you see missiles on the radar screen, but, but you have a longer response time, and that's considered stabilizing. Um, now, I've heard that... Uh, 
one excuse for us getting out of the INF treaty was that, well, Russia was kind of violating it anyway, or around the margins was fooling around. And then I've heard people say, well, yeah, we know what they were up to, but we're still better off with the treaty. What, what, what's the deal on that? Were, were both sides actually respecting it? I uh, I was then on the International Security Advisory Board for the Secretary of State and uh, saw the classified briefings on this. Uh, there's no question in my mind that Russia was violating the treaty. They were testing a system at ranges that were prohibited by the treaty. Uh, and the failure of, of the United States is that they never found a way to resolve that. This was going on in the last two, three years of the Obama administration never found a way to, to fix this violation. So when Trump comes in, he uses, again, this is John Bolton. This guy's a one-man, you know, treaty killer. He comes in and he wants to get rid of it for the same ideological reasons. No treaty should restrict U.S. options. And they're interested, we're interested, the United States, in developing new missiles of this range because the treaty bans them globally. You can't just put intermediate nuclear weapons in Europe, you can't put any missile of, of that carries any kind of warhead that has this range anywhere in the world. And we want them, at least some do, to counter China. We want to build new weapons of this range. So this is limiting us. Most people, I think, would see the, the, the us pulling the plug, using the excuse of a Russian violation as being a gift to Putin, because now it left Putin off the hook. He went ahead and developed those weapons because now there's no, there's no longer a violation because there's no treaty, which is just absurd. You know, mm -hmm. people violate the speed limit, but you don't repeal the speed limit. You punish the violators. In our case, we just threw out the law, and now the situation is worse. Both the United States and Russia are developing weapons of this range. Yeah, okay. Well, so little of this is encouraging and inspiring, Joe, I got to say. <laughs> Yeah. Well, we are in a bleak period. This is a period of retreat. You know, Sam Rayburn, the, the former Speaker of the House, used to say that any jackass could kick down a barn. It takes a carpenter to build one. Well, mm -hmm. we've had a lot of jackasses in government, uh, not just in the Trump administration, but even even over the over the, during the last 10 to 20 or 30 years. And they kicked down a lot of the architecture that was designed to reduce the conflict, to keep the, the conflict at lower levels, to be guardrails around it, to provide negotiating avenues for resolving conflict. They kicked them down, but they haven't put anything else in its place. So we are in a hole and we've dug it ourselves. Yeah. Um, is there any anything encouraging we can close on? Uh, no, no, there is no, there I'm is sorry. for example, the Biden boss nuclear post review comes out and they don't change a damn thing of the Trump mm -hmm. policy, except canceling two minor programs and, and m m reducing the number of instances that would be justified for use of it, for using a nuclear weapon or justification for using a nuclear weapon. But the, the missile programs continue, the new ICBM, the new sub, the new bomber, we're on track to spend $2 trillion on new nuclear weapons over the next 25 years while we're, you know, cutting funds for the pandemic, moving slowly, maybe even backwards on climate change. I mean, we are in deep trouble here. We, we, Biden came in promising a new way of thinking. that He was going to reimagine national security. And I think he meant it. I think that was the intention. But it hasn't worked. His domestic agenda has faltered and, and and he now wants you can see what they're doing for the midterms they want to bolster the idea of reducing crime and building up defense that they want to move towards the middle symbolically again it all becomes symbolic so these mm -hmm. life and death even planet threatening risks become you know symbols in a domestic mm. political battle and as a result we just keep well. digging and there's, I honestly, I honestly don't see a bright light here anytime in the near future. Well, I am in favor of crime reduction, but the other part, <laughs> there's a good way to do that. But, but, but I have been surprised by how uh, on the foreign on the foreign policy front, how kind of militant uh, the Biden administration has been generally. As, you know, to get back to to your area of expertise, they 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 seemed in, in no hurry to 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 get back into the the, nu the nuclear deal with Iran that Trump 
pulled us out right. of at the beginning. There was this weird. Right. And we're paying the price for it. They could have yeah. done it on day one like they did with the Paris Climate I mean, it would, be, it would be great to have that problem off the table, which it, it, would, and it be. would have been if they had <laughs> taken our advice. We would, they just we would, done it. But they were debating and they thought that their Trump sanctions could give them leverage and they could get a better deal from Iran. It was a complete illusion. It was a complete, you know, this kind of tough guy bravado that you see oh, there's so in, much of in that. so many Democratic circles. Right. Right. And it, was, it, and it, it backfired. It, it's it's at least as bad as, uh, well, the Republican administrations in in olden times, at least, you know, uh, George H.W. Bush, um, for example, were much more moderate in tone diplomatically than the Obama administration, probably than the Clinton administration, than the Biden administration. They didn't feel that their diplomats had to spend all their time, I mean, back in, 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 in the first Bush's administration, just threatening other countries and telling them yeah. what to do. They understood yeah. what kinds of things you say in public, what kinds of things you don't, uh, uh, use carrots and not sticks. It was, it was uh, look, I don't want to get yeah, into my own sermonizing, but haven't you just been a little surprised by the Biden administration in, in, in just a broad sense on foreign policy? Uh, I, I have. I mean, you always knew there was a, a dynamic between the so-called defense Democrats and the and the real reformers, the people who wanted to make real change. But it really did look like in the early days, especially with appointing Jake Sullivan as national security advisor, John Finer, deputy national security advisor, Tony Blinken, secretary of state, that the more that the more you know moderate or you might say progressive, moderately progressive elements were coming to the fore who all shared the vision. You go back to when Biden introduced his national security team and Jake Sullivan in November of, of, of 2020 at that press conference is talking about reimagining national security, that our mm -hmm. threats were not just military, they included, and he ticked them off, the pandemic, climate change, racial injustice, inequity in all its forms, you know, threats to democracy, and we're going to reimagine national security. And I think they thought they could have it all. They came right. in with a big defense budget, but a big domestic spending package. The domestic spending package crumbles, but they they forge ahead with the defense uh, 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 budgets now at astronomical levels. He's asking for eight hundred and thirteen billion dollars, the largest military budget since the end of World War II, and that's counting the Korean War, the Vietnam War, you know, the Reagan buildup. It's an enormous budget completely unjustified, especially given that one of our big threats that we're supposedly sizing the budget against is the Russian army. Mm -hmm. And the Russian army is a mess right now. These people couldn't invade Moldova, let alone- Don't, don't, you know, don't Eastern, jinx Eastern. it. Don't jinx it. <laughs> don't jinx it. Okay. They couldn't the invade you say Poland. that, this video is going to come back to haunt you. I give them 24 hours before they invade Moldova. Um, <laughs> the- the uh, I was just going to say that last thing you mentioned on on the, on the Biden Blinken agenda, you know, defending democracy. I think that thing has gotten us into into. Uh, I don't want to turn this into my standard soapbox too much, but I think the field that yeah. uh, they should spend a lot of time lecturing autocracies and authoritarian countries and so on has been one thing that has driven China and Russia together, and uh, and and so I think. I think that is it, that is that no longer looks like the the single biggest force that I think has driven us into a new cold war. But I, I personally think it has kind of had had that tendency. I understand, and remember that was part of a package because their focus was on defending democracy at home, and they were going to build up well, yeah. America to compete. Right. Right? I'm all for that. I'm all right. For that. Exactly, and that falters, and that falls down so they're not d building up the, the the safety nets they're not you know providing the kind of education and medical care and infrastructure building that they thought that were going to be they're not turning it into a green economy like they thought but the rhetoric on the foreign side continues and that is really a very unbalanced um policy set yeah 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 Okay, well, I, I guess the, the only good news is that you and I are both old enough to remember other times when things have seemed dark. Um, you know, the Cold War was a horrible thing. And, and, and I think, uh, I mean, just the sheer lack of communication among uh, great powers that could, in theory, come together and cooperate to do good things. Uh, I think you and I probably both feel the need to cooperate to do good things is even more acute mm -hmm. now, given the number of 
problem. And and right. you know, in, in your field, good uh, new whole new realms of weapons control, weapons in space, blah blah blah. These are problems we need to be working on. We're not. But but right. what 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 were you about to say? So here's the good news. Okay, good. When this war is over, assuming we get out of it. Uh, we're going to have a brief policy window in which we will be able to look back on the events of the last 20 or 30 years and judge the policy and be able to say, well, what, what, what did we do right? What did we do wrong? What could we have done differently to prevent this from happening in the first place? Not just Putin invading Ukraine, NATO expansion, neoliberal economic ideas forced on Russia in the 1990s. What could we have done differently there? But also, how did we end up that Putin 30 years after the end of the Cold War, it's got 6,000 nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. Why didn't we move faster to get rid of those weapons when we had the chance? And therefore, what can we do now going forward? We'll have that policy window. We got to be ready for it. And I want to thank you, Robert, for having the kind of discussion that helps us prepare the ground, that helps us prepare the kind of analysis we'll need to, to bring to that policy debate. I hope so. I got to say, we got work to do because at the moment in the current climate, if you if you talk about the possibility that the U.S. might have done some things better that that would have left us in a better place, you stand a pretty good chance of being called a Putin apologist. But but that's the way the heat of war is, and I think you know we have to you know be strong and 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 uh, and, and keep keep saying things we think are true, and the climate uh, may calm down a little uh, when uh, God willing yes. the war ends. Well, thank you so much, Joe. Uh, I, uh, I, I mentioned uh, your books, Bomb Scare, Nuclear Nightmares. Uh, your, your stuff is found in various places, uh, including Responsible Statecraft, the excellent uh, media outlet of the Quincy Institute, where you're a fellow. And then what is your, uh, what is your Twitter handle? At Cirincione, C-I-R-I-N-C-I-O-N-E. And okay. I'm fairly... Prolific on Twitter. You're active, and uh, some of your tweets are not about uh, the Washington senators. So, um, although a good a good portion are right. I, I don't mean the uh, I mean the Washington Nationals. I'm sorry. I was the Washington <laughs> listen. Well, you know what's funny, Joe. You know what's well, funny. You really slipped a few decades there. Well, listen. When I was six years old, my father was stationed at the uh, Pentagon. We lived in Virginia. I attended Washington Senators games. Okay, <laughs> I went to a Washington Senators baseball game. More than once. So uh, that was, yes, that was a slip from a senile person, but it wasn't well, as random as it sounded. Robert, as the weather uh, um, warms up and as hope springs eternal throughout the baseball world, if you want to come down, I will be I would, happy to take you I out to a game. To. Good seats. You buy the beer, I'll buy the tickets. I bet you've got good seats. After all, you are associated with the, uh, at least you know people in the military industrial <laughs> complex. I'm sure you have good seats. Um, okay, well, well, thanks so much, uh, Joe. Uh, it's Thank at Sirincioni. I am at Robert Ryder. We'll see people on Twitter.